I'm speaking this morning on the subject from plague to plenty. From plague to plenty. In the book of Joel, the first chapter, verses 1 through 4, says, The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. But the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the war- swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the calling locust has left, the consuming locust has eaten. In other words, the locusts have been busy eating things up. Judah had gone through a plague of locusts, one after another. Three separate waves of destroyers, one after another. I know a little bit about that because I can remember my parents moving from North Dakota when I was a year, well, I was a year and a half old. I can barely remember certain things about it, but I can remember them leaving because they had gone through several years of grasshoppers, one thing and another, that just stole the crops. And my father said, it's time that we move, and we went to the state state of Oregon, where there were lumber businesses that were looking to hire people. And so I understand a little bit about being struggling under those kinds of circumstances. Three separate waves of destroyers that they'd gone through. And there are three basic areas in our lives that we go through. Satan attacks each one to weaken our resistance. And when he does that, he attacks us physically. And we are taken down. Why? Because we can't work. Physically, we have been handicapped. And we can't produce the job. And the job doesn't produce the money. And the money isn't coming in. And we're on a struggle. And we're wondering, what are we going to do? And, and we, we, we coast along for a while. We do the best we can. We get a little here, a little there. Gradually take care of our basics. And everything is all right, but not good. And we're discouraged. And it's a problem. It's like a, it's like a plague that comes to us. Pain brings discomfort, so that when we are physically down, we are very uncomfortable, and it brings inability to focus on God's promises, because if you say, where are those promises? They're right there. They're right there, and that's when we learn to stand in spite of situations, instead of caving in and saying, if this is the way it works, forget it. Well, you forget it, and you'll get back even worse yet. You go down farther and farther. Why? Because God is always there. He's always there. He is our foundation. Now, weakened, the next attack is the natural follow-up. And I touched on it a moment ago. It's the financial handicap. Can't work. Money isn't coming in. Bills continue. Now we have even less focus on the word, and we are busy with our creditors, trying to keep them happy, a little here, a little there, and so on, trying to make everything work out, and we're going through. It's a plague. It's a hardship. It's a handicap that we're facing, and we struggle with it because a lack of finances in a difficult time is not an easy thing to go through. Just not. We've all gone through it at one time or another, probably. It's nothing to rob quicker than financial pressure. Man, financial pressure is a takedown in a hurry. It divides marriages. I've watched marriages break because of lack of money. Well, if he didn't do this, he could work more, he'd make more money, take care of us, and he doesn't want to work anymore, and so on. Well, if she didn't spend everything on this, and I don't know, oh, I've gone through that with so many, down through the years. Financial pressures in a marriage are hard. Because it's, you know, no one likes to take the blame for why we might be in a 
financial handicap. It's always his fault. No, it's her fault. No, it's our fault. We work on those things together. Should never destroy a marriage, but I've watched money destroy marriages down through the years. Over and over again, the dollar becomes the loud speaker. It speaks loud and says, oh, why do you put up with this? Why do you, well, why do we put up with anything that comes against us? Because it's a work in process. And in time, you'll get it settled, you'll get it straightened out. But in the meantime, I've watched it destroy marriages. I've counseled marriages in those times, and I've counseled to where they were benefited by the counsel. I've contacted them at times when there was no benefit through, no, no more. And the marriage is broken all because of the dollar bill. It's tragic. Because those things can always be worked out in time as a team working together. But we allow them to become major conflicts and they cause anger to rise in our spirits and our spirits then become antagonistic and antagonistic spirits become treacherous. And the next thing you know, we make decisions that we wish we hadn't made maybe later on, but it's too late now, we did it, it's all over. And all of a sudden, I'm through, I'm out of here, it's all over. Mm -hmm. All for a dollar. Now, let, let me just say that there is no dollar problem that you can't work through in time. And yet, I've seen it destructively drive marriages apart. I've watched the first things we stop in tight times is our tithe. We just, well, I just don't have it to give. Well, then I guess we don't have it to pay ComEd either. And I guess we don't have it to pay, well, you know all the other bills that come in every month. Yeah. But you know what? Those, I don't pay ComEd. I don't pay ComEd because they're broke. I pay ComEd because I need them. I don't give my tithe to the Lord because he's broke. I give my tithe to the Lord. I need him. I need him when everything else fails. I lean on him. And he is my source. He is the first thing I write a check for after I get paid. The first thing, not the last thing. And maybe sometimes not at all. And I say tragic that you count on God for so much and you give him nothing. Nothing. I, I just, I haven't, I haven't preached a sermon on tithing for years. And, it, and when the Holy Spirit brought this up, I thought, I guess it is about time that I kind of quickened this very important thing. We don't see a direct return like we do our paycheck for our labor. As a result of that, we say, well, I, I can go without get, paying my tithe. No, you can't, because I can tell you that over the long run, it is your biggest robber. And you make the decision. You make the decision. It isn't that God needs your money. It's that you need God desperately. And he is the multiplier of your time, your talent, and your giving. He's the multiplier of it. He's the one that will make your future. <laughs> I never, never write a letter to ComEd and tell them I don't have any money right now, it wouldn't do a bit of good. They just say, fine, turn it off. God doesn't do that. God is so patient with us, he waits a long time before he finally shuts down the blessing, and you come to understand, and you say, well, I, I don't know that I've really lost a blessing. I can tell you over time you will, because it's a law that will not be broken in time in time. Financial pressure caused us to look to man and his program rather than God and his provision. Let me say that again. Financial pressure 
causes us to look to man and his program rather than God and his provision. If you believe God and his promises, what you sow you will reap. If you believe that with all of your heart, it's only a matter of time till it will come back to you multiplied over and over. You rob yourself when you rob God. You don't rob God. He doesn't need you. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. All the gold in the world is his. When we get to heaven, the streets are paved with gold, they tell us. I don't know if I want to tarnish those streets by walking on them. I, I may go to the curbing to walk. I don't know. But I, we, God is not broke. That's not why we give. We give for kingdom values and because it's biblical and the promise of God is in the word. And when that word is acted upon, it will produce better than we can produce for ourselves. Now, so then the physical and financial in crisis and the next wave of the three would be a spiritual attack occurs. Oh, yeah. With so much church missed, we haven't eaten spiritual food very often. You know, I, I thought of preaching a sermon one of these days on the Lord's Day. Sunday is the Lord's Day. It doesn't say Sunday morning is the Lord's morning. It says the Lord's Day is the Lord's Day. The whole day is His. And yet we plan it for ourselves. And have no time for him. I mean, after all, I went to church Sunday morning. That's good enough. And that's why we don't grow spiritually, because some of the things we need to hear are not taught everything on a Sunday morning. You get some of it Sunday night. You get some of it in the teaching situations that you go through all the time. But the Sunday is the Lord's day all day. All day. <laughs> oh, the amens are getting a little less right there. You say, I never thought of it that way. I, that's why I'm telling you. The greater you understand the Word of God and the teachings get into your heart, the more you will walk a victorious life and a strength in your physical life as well as your spiritual life, your financial life. Why? Because you begin to understand God's promises, you act upon them, and you get the results of them. That's why it's so important. So much church missed that we haven't eaten spiritual food. And, and we, there's, there's no limit to what we need. You say, well, I, I get a lot. I, I get it on radio, too, and I get it. I know, but it's not like the brethren being together, and together we partake of the Word of God, like eating a meal together. We become strengthened together. I don't get strengthened off the food you eat, but I get strengthened off from the food that I eat in our fellowship, and I get strengthened off the spiritual food I eat in the fellowship of other believers. It becomes a life flow to me, a great life flow. Our normal prayer time is taken up with anxiety and desperation. You stop to think about it. The time that drives you to your knees more than anything is when you're under pressure when you're hitting a very difficult situation. Oh, my. It is hard. Anxiety and desperation will drive you to your prayer time. It'll drive you to your prayer search quicker than anything else in the world. I can tell you over and over again that physical problems create a drive. Financial problems create a drive. Relationships create a drive. We lean on the Lord in those times. We call upon Him. We declare, Lord, I need you now more than I've ever needed you. And God says, and I've needed you more than I've ever needed you, and you haven't had any time for me. No, He doesn't say that. That's what I would say if I was God. I'd, that's the way I'd answer it back. But He doesn't say that. He just says, come unto me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I'll meet your needs. I'll stand with you in your dark hours. I'll come to you in your difficult times. I'll be there when you need me. 
Even a praise service seems irrelevant and not germane at times because you can sit through a praise service and while you're praising the Lord, the difficulties you're facing sometimes come back into your mind. Lord, are you going to take care of this? How are you going to take care of it? What are we going to do? I'm waiting for your answers. Lord, will you answer me tonight before I go to bed? I'd, I don't know how it runs through your mind, but I can tell you that you search and search and search in your own brain. And when you don't get an answer there, you kind of think, oh, well, and you just kind of go on. No, that's not the place to go to the oh, well. That's the place to go to him and say, Lord, you're number one in my life. I need you more than I need anybody else or anything else. I need what you provide for me more than anybody else can provide. You begin to declare what you know is God's provision for you. And as you declare it, God understands the drive of your heart and he rises to meet your need. That's as normal as it can be. So when I say that even a praise service seems irrelevant and not germane at times, it's because we get so focused on what we're going through out of the three different areas that we sometimes go through, physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, in every dimension. When we go through all of those, we are going through them and we sometimes struggle and we say, God, I don't know why I'm under such a strain. He says, just be faithful and I will walk you through it and on the other side of this, this struggle, you will see my victory come. I could give you so many illustrations in my personal life of times when God has met me at the darkest of hours and financial struggles, when I didn't know what I was going to do and all of a sudden there was a provision came out of the blue that I had no idea where it would have come from and God provided not only what I needed but more than I needed. I've seen it more than I need it. And I have learned to trust him completely in the darkest of situations. Darkest of situations. Finally, we can't physically make it to church, so our car has been repossessed. I have an eviction notice from the landlord. What am I going to do? You begin to look back and you say, what am I going to do? How, how am I going to, I can't, I can't drive to church. They've taken my car away from me. I'm, about, I'm going to have to give up my, my apartment, my house. What am I going to do? I'm going to say this. If in fact you have robbed God, start right there to put things back together. Make a covenant with God. Say, Lord, what you provide for me, the first fruits will come back to you. He makes that very clear in the scripture. He calls them the first fruits. First fruits of the harvest, meaning that there's more. But the first fruits come to him. He is our source in everything. So why do we ignore him until we get put in a corner and we don't have a choice but making a, a commitment to say, God, I understand what I've done. I understand how I've overlooked. From now on, here's what it'll be. And we declare that we'll serve him. Three waves of destroyers have devastated me. I sit on a chair and I cry. And there's just no way out. I don't know what I'm going to do. Listen, crying isn't going to do you a bit of good. I'll tell you what will do you the good is look back over the history and say, where have I missed my steps? Where have I missed my responsibility? You say, well, I don't know why. Where the Lord is. He's letting me down. No, he doesn't let anybody down. No. Look for where you have been careless in your lifestyle, in your, in your procedures, where you have been careless. That's where you're going to find the solution to your problem. God doesn't have a problem. ComEd doesn't have a problem. I've got a problem if I don't send it in. I don't, uh, God doesn't have a problem. We have the problems. We sometimes get careless with what God has blessed us with so much. Let me turn to, this, to Joel, the second chapter, verse 12 through 19. He says this, chapter 2, verse 12 through 19. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. 
So rend your heart and not your garments. To return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. He doesn't want to hurt. Doesn't want to hurt, not at all. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. That's where we need to go. Now, I turn to the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, and God gives us a magnificent promise. Chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. What are the tithes? They're just 10% of our income. That's all. 90% is yours. Do what you want with. I'd say he's real fair. Even if he said 50% is mine and 50% is, I think he's real fair. But he only asked for 10%. Then he says you can give offerings beyond that which is your heart pouring out to want to bless somebody or something or some ministry or some function for his glory. But he said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room to receive it. Now, let me just tell you, I understand this scripture so well. I've watched it work hundreds of times for people who have poured their heart out to me in their difficult hours and who just couldn't afford to give God his portion and over a period of time come crying. I don't know what I'm going to do, Pastor. I just don't know where I'm going to turn. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, you begin to put God first. He says, try me and just see if I won't do it. I said, if you will just go to this scripture, stand upon it, and act upon it, you will discover what God has promised will come to pass. And then he says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, God says, you watch. I'll take care of it and it'll come back to you over and over again. In our lowest hour, we cry in repentance and consecration, and in our renewed focus of obedience, declaring God's word in our lives and saying, God, I'm trusting you completely, and here's the tithe. And by the way, that's why I throw in some extra offering as well. I just make sure that I'm covered. I don't want to be anything short. Declaring God's word in our lives. Lord, you promised. He says, yeah, what have you promised? And I say, well, I, I, I promised you that I would, I would give the 10% plus offerings, the tithes and the offerings. That's what it talks about. If you do that, I guarantee you, you may go through some tight times, but you'll never be up against the wall. Amen. You will, if in fact... You obey the word and you do it. He will see you through. About the time you hit the wall, he'll come up with an answer you hadn't expected. And you didn't understand how it came, but he met your need in that hour. I've seen it over and over again. God once again rebukes the devourer. But who is the devourer? Satan himself. Jesus is the restorer. Satan is the devourer. When things are being devoured, look for where it's going. It's not because you've given too much to the Lord's work. You say, well, I gave so much that now I'm broke. I can guarantee you that will not happen. It may, you may go through a tight time, but it'll then rise again, and you'll watch God provide for you in a dimension you would never had experienced. Time and time again. In Joel 2, verse 20 through 25, Joel 2, verse 20 through 25, it says this. But I, am, I will remove, the, remove far from you the northern army, and I will drive him away into a barren and desolate land 
with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea, his stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. In other words, Satan does bad things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit, and the fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the latter rain to come down for you, and the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat, the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil, so I will restore to you the years that the locust and the, star, the swarming locust has eaten, and the crawling locust and the consuming locust and the chewing locust, my great army which was sent among you. Ah, he is telling us, I will come against the armies of the enemy, and I will defeat them, and I will bring victory into your life. God is saying that when you forget your losses, your locusts, and call on me, I will hear and answer. Get your eyes off the locusts that have eaten up your resources. Losses are locusts in your life. God says, this is how I take care of them. And he destroys the locusts over and over again. Not only will blessings be abundant, but I will restore the years the destroyer has robbed from you. That's what he says. In Joshua 14, verse 7 through 12, says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I completely followed the, whole, the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where you, your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord your God. Now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. And as yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. The promise that you have made to me, this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were there and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. God says, you've got an enemy all right, but you can drive him out. I'll be with you. It was as if Caleb was 40 years old again and here he is 80 40 years old again in other words age isn't going to bother me it's he I trust and I trust him completely if, if it was if Caleb was 40 years old again and he was excited about destroying giants in a fortified circumstance can you imagine that? Why? He was doing, he was making plans on the promise of God. Make your plans on the promise of God, not the circumstances you're in. If you make your plans on the circumstances you're in, you'll be discouraged. You'll back away. You'll see no answer. But if you make your plans on the promise of God, he will give you courage to rise up and say, I'll take the enemy on. I'll go after those giants. They will not rob me, nor will they keep me from my promise of my future. The impossible was not impossible. In chapter 15, verse 14, here's what he did. Caleb drove out the three sons of Anakim, and for them, from them Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talami, the children of Anak, those were the giants. He drove them out. Drove them out. Why? He focused on 
God's solution, not his fears. Most of us focus on our fears. Why? Because it's staring us in the face. That's why we need to get back to the word and let the word stare us in the face. And the promise of God declare to you what your future is. Not your circumstances. Not the things around you. The impossible was not impossible. He killed them. He saw those giants. He knew they were there, and he took them on. Why? Because God says, I'll take care of them for you. That's why. And if God says, I'll take care of it for you, that's where you need to build your faith. In Joel 2, 26 and 27, let me go back to it. Joel 22, 26 and 27. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Wow, I love that verse. Verse 27. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. I love that verse. Let me tell you, I've chewed that verse up and swallowed it many times. Why? Because I've needed to depend upon what he said. The refreshing causes you to forget the severity of the locusts. Then on top of that, there comes a new dimension of the spirit. In verse 28 through 32, it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. There will be a spiritual flow begin to take place in your home, in your life. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant, among the Lord's calls. Now, salvation and deliverance is for everyone. And the promises of God after you are born again is for everyone who hears his voice, obeys his call, enters that call, submits themselves, and victory is theirs forever. Absolutely forever. He'll never take it away from you. As you walk in it, it will become your great joy. Your great joy. I'm just talking this morning about moving from plague to plenty. Some of you who've gone through some very difficult times, very discouraging situations, I understand that. I've been through them. I know what they are, and I know what the solution is. I get back on track with the one who has authority over heaven and earth, and I trust him completely as my guide, my strength, in all that I need. And he said, I'll never let you be put to shame if you obey me and walk in my purpose. Shall we pray? Father, I thank you this morning for the promises of your word that assure us that we are not going to be put down or lose the future. As we trust in you, you are our source. If we obey your word, we reap your benefits. If we sow your seed, we reap the multiplication of your seed. I pray that this morning it'll be an eye opener, a heart opener, and a future commitment to honor you in all that you are to us, for us, and with us. And bless our steps as we walk to serve you and love you and honor you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.